Stories affect us. Scary campfire tales cause every nighttime noise to run our imaginations wild. Romance stories pull us into sentimental remembrances of relationships real or imagined. And funny stories tickle us into fits of laughter, and we can hardly wait to share them with somebody else. There are also stories that can cause negative reactions like anger, sorrow, or doubt. And according to Dr. Jeremy Camry Hogart of Vanguard University, any well-lived life has room for such negative emotions because anger, quote, anger at the right things and in the right degree can drive our quest for justice. Sorrow can help us leave things in the past and move forward to brand new things. And it can help us to empathize more deeply with others who are experiencing loss. And doubt can push us to look past the obvious and sometimes even to discover the profound, end quote. Oftentimes, the things that touch us most deeply is exactly needed at that moment to cause us to arise in our most holy faith. Often under the greatest pressure is where we'll see the greatest victory because we don't see the way and God has always said, He is the way, the truth, and the life. Always and forever, in the darkest moment, He reminds us He is the light. There are exasperating moments in all of our lives when we've dusted our hands off and we've said, that's it, that's enough, that's all I can take. I'm alligators up to my eyebrows, I'm done, I'm over, I quit, I stop. And just about that time, God comes with an answer and you go, what? I wasn't even looking for that answer. I was looking for this answer and you give me that answer. What? What's up with that, God? When I need this, why do you give me that? And God winks at us and says, my timing is perfect. Just want you to know I'm still hanging around. I'm closer than anything to your heart and your life. In the greatest moments of despair are the greatest moments of revelation. Please understand this morning, I heard recently a television preacher, in fact, I think it was John Hagee, talked about a young lady who was caught and her crime way back in the early church century is that she believed in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and refused to worship the emperor as God. And for that, they put her in the arena, tied her in a cargo net, and equipped a bull with sharp bronze tips on the ends of the horns and got this bull so angry he charged the swaying net and gouged again and again and again and again as the blood was dripping into the arena. She reached through the cargo net with her fingers and showed the sign of the first Christians, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit holding three fingers triumphantly as suddenly her arms sagged and she died there in that cargo net. Ah, do you just like Jesus? You just like him? Or do you truly love him? Is he just someone that you, mm, I get out of hell, I'm going to heaven kind of an idea? Or truly do you know he's the savior of your soul? Do you understand and know that he gave it all for you and for me so that our lives could be saved? And now I want, I want to take you to the scripture here this morning, please. Um, I, I want you to look at this carefully thinking of the stories that have affected our lives and how we've responded to them. Let's take a closer look at the Christmas story and wonder about the details and the choices that were made and decisions that changed history forever. In Luke chapter 2, verse number 1 through 20, we're just going to take the next few minutes to discuss this together. And as it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus, it was, this was Octavius, by the way, also, that all the world or that entire area should be registered. This census first took place when Quirinius was governing Syria, so that all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of that house and lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed or espoused, or 
he was engaged to marry. He'd taken her as his wife. By the way, something you need to know about um, those early uh, times is that an engagement could only be broken by a divorce. An engagement was as real as it got, except there was no coming together physically just to prove their purity, their chastity to one another. So they were still engaged, and now this engagement was developing into a marriage. They took Mary. She was great with child. Great with child. Friends, notice this. This pregnancy was absolutely unexplained by natural cause. Perhaps the thought was that she had been waylaid by a uh, Roman soldier. Maybe she had been out in a field and raped somehow and came up pregnant. Maybe this, that, or the other. All kinds of questions and conjectures about this young lady. Yet because she knew her contact with God and Holy Spirit had revealed that she would bear a child by the power and the presence of Holy Spirit, she stood her grounds. Can you imagine the natural shame and guilt of presenting herself unmarried, being pregnant, and yet God spoke to Joseph. He said, don't worry about it. This is not by a fluke. This is not by an accident. This is not by an attack. But by the plan of God, Holy Spirit has caused the Son of God to be conceived within her. And Joseph swallowed that as truth. Aren't you glad he believed the narrative of Mary? And when people questioned them and said, aren't you ashamed that you're just engaged and, and Mary's pregnant already? Joseph stood there barefaced and said, I know whom I believed in. I'm persuaded that what God does is right and proper because I've had a revelation. This is of God. Listen, church, they stood their ground. Their narrative was that they had had a meeting with God and God had spoken to them a promise that overcame all fear, all intended grief or shame was eradicated as they stood in the revelation of God himself tall order for a young couple, but doable because God had spoken to their hearts. Can you still trust God when your story is altered to the point that someone looks at you and goes, huh? What? Yeah. Details and your conditions and circumstances, surely God's punishing you. Surely God's bringing something against you. Where did you miss it? What did you do wrong? to deserve to be in the place that you're in. And God says to our hearts, do you still believe? Are you still able to rise up in your most holy faith and trust God's narrative in your life? Verse 6, so it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the end. Tradition in Jewish births were this. After the child was born, they would rub it dry, wash it with water, and then scrub it with salt to purify the flesh. And then that child would be wrapped in swaddling clothes. That's what happened to Jesus. Humble beginnings. Smelly and uncomfortable place, that old barn. Hey, look, I've been in a, I'm a city boy, but I've been in a couple of barns. When I was a kid, I remember my brother and I, I was about 12. He must have been about six or seven after that, somewhere around there. We're visiting back in Ohio at a shirt tail Ken's farm. And the kids said, hey, you want to have some fun? So they took us out and they had an old goat tied up in the barn. And one of the cousins went in the house and got a pair of scissors. We're going to shear this goat like you shear a sheep. They cut all the fur off that goat. Have you ever smelled a goat up close? They said, come on, you city kids, ride the goat. We rode all over the place. Finally, when it's time to go home, we gathered together, and our parents looked at us and our aunt and uncle, and they said, where have you been? We'd been in the barn. We'd been riding the goat. We're city kids. Don't, don't you ever ride a pony and have your picture taken? We didn't know the difference. But boy, did we stink. Listen, I know what a barn smells like, guys. And when they made us ride home with all the windows down in a cold Ohio and then shed our clothes outside the house before they would allow us even to come in for a shower, I know what it's like to be in a barn. 
So there they were, Mary and Joseph in a barn. Didn't have any air fresheners, fresheners in those days, but... <laughs> Verse number 8, now, there were in this... Have you ever been in a stinky place? Can you still trust God? Have you ever been in a place where even people agree with you? This is a stinky place. Can you still trust him? I think we better. Verse 8. They were in the same country, shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over the flock by night. Why shepherds? Why these characters? Listen, they're out with the sheep. You ever, been, you ever smelled a sheep up close? <laughs> Why them? They didn't have a highly respected job. What could their testimony be worth? You know, sometimes when people talk to you, we judge with our eyes. They're dressed differently. They act differently. They have a different culture, whatever. And we judge them with our eyes, what they have to say to us. We may think in our hearts, that's not worth anything because they're not like us. Friends, can you still trust God? Can you still trust him when your eyes tell you one thing? But God tells you something else. You know, when, when I go to uh, certain stores and I'm wearing my suit, people act differently than when I go in my grubbies with my baseball hat and my hair all askew, sticking out the edges and in my grubbies. They treat me different because people tend to judge with their eyes. You ever discovered that? Can you trust the Lord when your circumstances don't look quite like you think they might or should be? God says, can you still trust me? Verse number 9, Behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were greatly afraid. And the angel said to them, Don't be afraid. Always and forever God will speak to our hearts, and this will be his message. Don't fear. Even at the moment, my precious friend, when we're about to take our last breath and close our eyes, God will speak distinctly to our hearts, and he will say, Don't fear. It's a short step to the glory of the Lord. I emphasize to our hearts today that God who brought us into this world and saved our souls will be there when we step out of this world and his comfort and his peace in the midst of the sorrow of our passing for our family and our friends, he'll speak sweetly to our hearts and say, peace, be still. I'm with you always and you'll be with me forever in just a few moments. Peace is spoken to our hearts. Don't be afraid. The angel says, For behold, I bring to you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord Savior. To be saved from something which brings me destruction. To be saved from something which brings me danger. To be saved... In the presence of God, by Christ the Lord, the one sent for me, for you. And this will be the sign to you. You'll find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Was heaven's announcement wasted on smelly shepherds? Hear me, church. Sometimes God's exuberant love seems to be poured upon those who least deserve it. And we go, God, couldn't you do better than that? But there was a day, friends, when we were lost in our sins and trespasses. And I don't, I don't care this morning the degree of your involvement in sin or rebellion, whatever it was, how little, how great, it doesn't matter. Everyone is separated by sin from God. God is the one who comes in not with a measuring stick to see how good you've been or how bad you've been. Santa Claus supposedly keeps that kind of record. But God has a record like this. Your sins and mine were judged on the cross. It's under a cover this morning, but the cross is over there on the side of the platform. Your sins and mine were judged on the cross. Jesus took our guilt and our shame, our sin, bore it for us, that we might bear his righteousness that he earned by being obedient even to the death on the cross. His innocence is ours through faith in what he did for us. Was heaven's announcement wasted on smelly shepherds? Don't think so. Can you still trust him? Yes. Verse 13, And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory, glory to God in the highest, 
and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. Extravagant display? Was it wasted on the shepherds? Was it too little, too late? People have been crying for a thousand years or more. Oh, God, send us Messiah. Send us the Deliverer. Get us out of the mess of bondage and, and oppression by the enemies of our people. Was it too little, too late? Or was it too much, too soon? To many who would hear the story of the gospel, they would say, Nah, uh -uh. someday God will answer. There will come a day, my precious friend, in your deepest, darkest despair. The answer will come. Will you have been caught in trusting him so that the least glimmer of hope that he whispers into your heart of hearts, will it ignite the faith that he has planted there already? Think with me this morning, dear friend. Will you have succumbed to pressure? Or will you be living in hope that God who knows us best knows how to meet the need of our hearts? Oftentimes the answer comes in a moment. Will you be ready to receive it and grasp it? My friends, I could tell you the stories of of dozens of people who invented something that changed our world. And the reason they caught it is because they were in a state of awareness and they noticed. How many people have lost things and discarded things that could have changed their lives had they only been expecting that moment of grace? I tell you this morning to all of our hearts in this place, no matter where you are in your journey, hope is afoot. Answer is just right there. Will you be responsive to grasp that which God gives and to cause your heart to be aware that God may whisper his deepest answers? to your heart or will you just gloss over friend the answer to everyone's eternal question is available through Jesus Christ and yet so many gloss over ignore and discard God Almighty's eternal answer for salvation well I don't believe it like that well who, special you God bless your darling little gizzard well, I don't know. I don't Listen, God wrote the thing, guys. I didn't write it. He did. And if he's going to present to us his answer, why not take his answer, not your con con distorted misunderstanding of who God is and how he's acting towards us? He's a God of love. He's a God of mercy. He's a God of grace. Won't you receive his answer today? A little bit further, we're almost done. So when the angels had gone away from them into heaven, then the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste, and they found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Clear directions were given to them. Clear directions are given to us. Will they obey? Will we obey? Go to a city some distance away. Look until you find the baby lying in a manger. Will they obey those instructions? Respond to the Lord Jesus Christ in his love and mercy and grace. Respond to his sacrifice for you. Respond to a heavenly father who loved us so much that he spent everything of heaven to bring us life everlasting. Will you obey? Will you go in a search for him just like the shepherds went in search of the baby? The potential answer for all their needs. Will you search for the answer that is heaven's response to your deepest need? Wow. Can you still trust him?
Verse 17, now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told to them by the shepherds. Friends, the least among them told the best story and the rest believed. Can you still trust him? The narrative is that God did not pull a rabbit out of a hat, but he performed a miracle to give us the answer of all ages. Verse 19, but Mary kept these things in her heart, pondered them in her heart and spirit, and then the shepherds returned, glorifying, praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told to them. They went back to the fields. They went back to the smelly sheep. They went back to their faithful positions. But the change that was in their lives resounded through them as they continued to tell what they had discovered, that Jesus was Lord and God's answer. Will you tell your story of how you heard the good news? Say, well, my story is too simple. My story is, I mean, I remember sitting in church and hearing the drug addicts preach about how God had set them free and go, God, I've never been a drug addict. I heard people preach about what kind of a horrible life they'd come out and how God had set them free. And I sat there and said, oh, God, the only thing I've ever been addicted to is ding-dongs and Twinkies. <laughs> what kind of a testimony do I have? I mean, I was, there was a season I went through where I was just absolutely grossed out because I had no horror story to tell about conversion. That could have stopped me but I trusted him anyway. I'm not trying to tell you I was a goody two-shoes. I'm just trying to tell you. I, did, I couldn't compare to some of these testimonies that I heard. And God finally said to me one day, Lan, you've got your own testimony of grace. Be satisfied with it. Oh, hallelujah. Will you tell your story, your Jesus story? Can you still trust him? Can you still trust the simple narrative, the story of Jesus? You've seen it portrayed in a play this morning. You've probably seen that over the years a dozen times or more. Can you believe the word that God loves you so much he gave us everything for you? Well, friends, I tell you as a church, we believe in this story. Why? Because the story of Jesus saved us from fear to faith, from hell to heaven, from lack to fullness in the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you bow your hearts with us this morning? Heavenly Father, as simplistic as the gospel is, yet it is so profoundly involved with you making a way where there seemed to be no way, with you coming up with a God answer. Not a human answer, but a God answer. And you, O oh Lord, veiled in flesh, taking flesh and dwelling among us, becoming our Lord and Savior, by bearing our sins and bearing our sorrow and taking away our guilt and our shame. Oh, God, I'm just asking for revelation knowledge in this house this morning. Would you uncover eyes clouded by doubt and fear? Would you uncover hearts that are hidden behind guilt or shame? Would you uncover our lives, oh, Lord, that are hidden behind questions we think there are no answers to or... God's situation is so heavy and great in our hearts that we think there's no way, no hope. Maybe even some believe, how can God love me? I know who I am and what I've done. But, oh, Lord, would you break through all the excuses? And would you please reveal that we are more loved than we can imagine? We're much more forgiven than we can possibly think there's any deserving grace in that at all. And that, Lord, that you make us accepted in your precious family. Would you break that truth forth in hearts and lives today? In Jesus' name. And now, precious friend, if you just look this way, I, I, I'm just going to ask you this morning, would you be brave enough and bold enough in your own heart to admit or some in here that need Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And I ask you to look deep within your spirit. Ask yourself this question. 
If God went all that way to go out of his way, to come from his place to our place, to prepare us to take us back to his place one day, if God did that, then who are we to stand in the way of God's grace? Questions are okay. Doubts are okay. Fears are okay. Until all of a sudden God comes and he says, would you trade me your fear for faith? Would you trade your doubt for my assurance? Would you trade your question for trust in me? Because God knows how to lead us from here, through life, to there in his presence. I testify to you this morning. I found the way because God found me first. I live this life because he enables me to live this life. Not that I'm constantly looking for a way to toe the line. I'm not. I just simply trust Christ. Do I slip sometimes? Sure, all of us slip in some manner or other. Am I perfect? No, God declares me perfect. But I know know the glitches in my giddy-up. How about y'all? But I know he loves me. And I know he set me free. And I I know one day he'll lead me from here to glory. And it'll be the most powerful day in my entire existence. And I will live forever in his presence. And I, I just extend that to you today. Not as pressure against you. But an offering of deliverance for you. Because see, you matter to me because you matter to God. I won't belabor this any longer. If you're sitting here today and you say, you know, Pastor, this is the time, this is the moment when I decide I'm going to surrender to the Lord. Then would you just lift your hand where you are? And by that you say, I give up, Jesus. Here I am. I surrender to you. Simple question in our hearts and our lives. Are there any here who would do that I give you that opportunity yes thank you let me put your hand down thank you are there others see in that moment a decision was made I ministered one day and I asked that and a lady was looking across the congregation and she said who would respond to such a thing And by the time her hand got to this side of her body, she saw that it was her hand that was raised. That day she prayed a simple prayer, changed her life forever. And she could hardly believe that she had responded. Her hand responded before she really knew it. It was great. And the change in her life was marvelous. Did she have her issues? Did she have her battles? Sure. But she had a Savior who saw her through. Would you stand with me, please? We're going to pray a prayer of commitment this morning for the hand that was raised today. We're going to pray it together as a congregation because I want you to hear with your mouth, say with your mouth what your heart believes. Are you ready? Pray this prayer of commitment, would you please? Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, O Lord, that you love me. I repent, O Lord, for the sin in my life. And I believe that you forgive me because I asked, just like your word says. Now, Lord, live big in me as I commit my way and my life to you. I am yours. You are mine. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Hallelujah. Woohoo. What a gift to Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah.